Amen, church. You may be seated. Lord Jesus, Master, I know you are the Son of God, Savior of the world. But you're not a financial consultant. And that's exactly what I'm looking for right now. Lord Jesus, Master, I know you heal the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons. But I have cancer. And I don't see a, a title of doctor in front of your name. And Lord Jesus, Master, I know, I know that you have saved me at the cross and at the resurrection from my own life in sin and death. But... I have to make a major career path decision. And I don't think you majored in business. You guys ever talk like that to God? Some form, some fashion? Probably so, right? In one breath, you're declaring that Jesus is the Lord. He is the master of everything. You're acknowledging that. And yet, in the very next second, you're pulling it all back because you want control. You're not sure God's hearing your prayer exactly the way you want it to come out. Or you may think he's hearing your prayer, but he doesn't want to do it. Or maybe he, you just don't think he's as good at getting it done as you are. In other words, I am the God of my own life, is what we're saying. Case in point, Luke chapter 5, today's scripture text. Where we rediscover Luke and the power... That comes when we simply obey Jesus. We drop the nets. That is, we drop our own pride. We drop our own sense of control. And we do something extremely humble. We do something extremely against the world's thinking. And we trust Jesus. And we begin to follow him. Simon Peter and the rest of the fishing team are hearing Jesus preach from the boats. And they're amazed and they thought, these are words that we can live by. Words that can change our lives. And yet, the moment that Jesus tells them to push out a little bit deeper, another place on the lake, move from fishing over here where they're not having success, to over here, Peter thinks, well, maybe it's necessary to correct Jesus on his fishing knowledges and his strategies. Luke 5 and 5, it says this, Master, do you hear him? Master, we've been working. We've been working all night long, but we've caught nothing. In other words, we call you master, but really we are thinking ourselves as the masters of fishing. We are the professionals in this boat, and if the fish aren't biting, then it's not on us. Now, we know that you're a great carpenter. We know you're a really good preacher, but there's no way you can also be a great fisherman like we are in this situation. And yet, here comes a major turn in Simon Peter's thinking. Because he immediately catches himself. You get it? They're not catching fish, but Simon Peter's catching his own words. And he pulls them back, and Simon Peter says, And yet, Lord, if you say so. I love that part. And yet, Lord, because you say so, I'm going to do something here that does not make any sense. I'm going to die to myself. I'm going to begin trusting you more than I'm trusting me. I'm going to start believing that you can do better than I can do. And so I'm going to turn the control over to you, Jesus. You are now the captain of this ship. <laughs> now think a moment on what Jesus was actually asking the fishermen. They're fishing over here. Nothing, 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 nothing. Hey, why don't you try over here? Does that make any sense to you guys? No, it, it doesn't. Luke chapter 5, Simon Peter and the boys break common sense. They throw their nets out. What were they thinking? Huh. And suddenly, there's the amazing catch. So much so that the nets are nearly breaking. They're so abundant. And then the men do something quite amazing. They call out to the other partners in the other boat and say, come along, let's assist in this grand, over-the-top miracle of God's provision. Now, why is that so important? Here's two reasons that I'd like to briefly share. Number one, we Christians, and including the church, sometimes operate and think more in the power of the world 
rather than in the power of the Holy Spirit and the kingdom of God. We look like the government sometimes in all that we say and do. And yet God says, I want you to think differently. I want you to think kingdom-wise. I want you to think like I think. That's reason number one. Reason number two, when we desire to control the nets ourselves, it often leads to the temptation that really it is all about us. I mean, we can change things if we, if we just make some adjustments, if we just make some changes around here. And when that happens, there's no room for expansion. We're not including anyone else as God would include. God says, hey, in invite others from the other boats to come and expand my influence. Because Jesus' calling to fish for an abundant catch goes way beyond just their boats. It is for the whole church to share in the kingdom harvest. For the whole church to work together to say, hey, that's the one true God for us here in Woodbury, Minnesota, the United States, the world. Disciples of Jesus do not isolate themselves inside boats or inside buildings expecting everybody to just come to us. How's that working out? Not so well. Instead, we are called to partner with other disciples, other like-minded Christians from around the same lake. Same Woodbury, same Twin Cities, same state, same United States, same world. And in that moment, Simon Peter and the boys become ashamed of their thinking because they've just experienced what happens in the midst of a miracle. What's going to be your response when Jesus says, do this, and we do it, and then something wonderful happens? What's our experience of that? Huh? We let go of our nets, and we begin to follow him. Boom, when that happens, the nets are are filled. The provision comes. Now the provision can come financially. It could come in material needs. But even more so, I think it's the, the, the need for a bolder faith for such a day as this. We live in a culture where it's no longer Christian. We live in a culture where we're called to go and make disciples against a group of folks saying, I'm not biting on that. So we need to go beyond our own trickery, our own cleverness, our own power, and instead tap into the power of God so that we're able to point to Jesus as the hope of the world. And then people say, you're right. You're right because I see it reflected in his disciples. Again, such a move like that does not make sense to the ways of the world, does it? So why would we want to operate like the ways of the world? Instead, it looks really well and operates well in the kingdom of God because the kingdom of God is always the opposite of the kingdom of this world. And friends, let me ask, aren't you glad? Otherwise, how might sin be transformed into service? How might graves be moved into gardens? How might the lost be transformed into the found? The Bible says from our gospel text today, Luke chapter 5, Jesus says to Simon, do not be afraid. I know what you just saw here breaks common sense. I know you've never seen anything like this before. I know you might even be a little bit ashamed. But do not be afraid. Take heart. Because now God is inviting you into a greater purpose. A greater life than the grind that you're currently going through. I'm inviting you to start catching people. And you'll discover, wow, God is who he says he is. There is power in the presence of the holy. And we do get to be a part of something bigger than just my own little tiny world. And what is the response inside that boat? Simon Peter falls on his knees in repentance of his own self-reliance. And the fishermen, they drop their nets. And they begin to follow Jesus. Jesus had not only caught their hearts, but he had caught their futures. And he's fishing for us as well. Our hearts, our futures. Becoming nothing in that moment. Turning over the reins. Saying, I don't think I can be God very well anymore. And becoming nothing allows them to have everything. Everything. What if we just tried that? Now, of course, this begs the question, what will come next? The boys drop their nets. They're following Jesus. What does that mean? What's next? And huh, what's next for us? 
Would you look to the screen, you'll see the following top 10 list. This is what's typically seen as the what is next for spiritual maturity. In other words, someone comes to salvation for the first time. They hear about Jesus and they fall on their knees and they say, that's the kind of master I need. Well, what's next? Or maybe you've had a eureka or a breakthrough through a Bible study and you ask the question, well, what is next? Or maybe you're joining a new church and the big question coming out of your mouth is, well, what is next for us? Well, here's your typical list. Number one, attend Sunday morning Bible or Sunday morning worship services on a regular basis. That's always a good idea. Number two, have a daily devo with scripture reading. Number three, tithe. 10%. How about that for letting go of your nets and trusting God? Number four, attend a weekly small group Bible study. You're not only in the Word of God and being held accountable to it in a great way, but you're also discipling others while being disciples. Or number five, you go on a, a national or international mission trip, seeing and experiencing what God is doing in other places. Or how about number six, have a daily prayer time where you listen and talk with God. Listen to Christian music. My dear wife Joanne fills our house with Christian music from the Christian radio stations 24-7. Changes the atmosphere every time. Or how about when you're driving? I drive 45 minutes from my home in Savage to here. I fill it up with Christian music. Man, when I walk into the church, I'm ready to go now because the Word of God has been thrown my way and I've grabbed it. I've bitten it. All right? Number eight. Because of that, we cut down on other things of life that are ungodly, you know, drinking, swearing. You don't go to hell for that stuff, but you certainly put yourself in a path to no longer trust God. Or how about number nine? Obey the Ten Commandments as best we can as sinners. And then number ten, you're so excited about what God is doing in your life and in the life of this church that you want others to know and you invite them and you're unashamed. All ten of these points are fantastic practices for the classic, what is next, a spiritual maturity. But the scary truth is, you can do all ten of these consistently and still not possess the three key traits. Jesus said are required to be his drop-net disciples. And what are those three key traits of obedience? We're going to put those on the screen, and let's make a declaration together, shall we? Together, let's say, number one is to abide in Jesus. Number two, to love like Jesus. Number three, to die to self with Jesus. Very good. So let's do a deeper dive into these three biblical traits of what it looks like to become drop-net disciples of Jesus. Here we go. Trait number one is abide in Jesus. Say that with me. Abide in Jesus. John 15, 5. Jesus says, I am the vine. I am the source of your life. And you get to be my branches. Aren't you glad? Those who abide in me and I in them bear much fruit. Boom. Provisions can just roll out. Because apart from me, separate from me, you can do nothing. Now, the world will hear that last line and say, ha, <laughs> you Jesus freaks. Are you kidding me? That's not true. So who are you going to believe today, friends? Savior of the world? Who provides miraculously? Or the world? Hit and miss. To abide in Jesus means to rest in him or remain in him continually. It means to literally have the Word of God grafted onto your heart and your head so that you now begin to feel like God feels and you begin to speak like Jesus speaks and you begin to act like He acts. I'll speak more to that next Sunday. Jesus says, apart from Him, in other words, not abiding, disobeying, disconnecting yourself, trying to accomplish something great on your own power will ultimately fail. Because Apart from Jesus, nothing of any major significance will ever have a breakthrough or longevity. Now think back to our text today. Did the fishermen lack in skill? I doubt it. They were pros. Did they lack in determination? Perseverance? The Bible says they fished all night long. How about that? Maybe there just simply wasn't enough fish in the lake. That can't be true because moments later... 
Jesus shows up and boom, there's, there's an abundance. Hear this. Only in drop your net obedience to Jesus did they finally find all sorts of available fish. And that's when the breakthroughs came that shut out the shutout. When Jesus shows up and we obey him, everything changes. I got that line from last Sunday. I took this picture last Sunday night. As some of you know, I work for the Fellowship of Christian Athletes as the Southern Metro Director. And so I was a part of over 100 Metro leadership kids, high school kids. We're discipling them to disciple others. And this young man, his name is Manny. He's a junior from Bloomington, Jefferson. What a declaration his sweatshirt is saying as he enters into that school every day. I think that's what Jesus is saying here today in our text. The very first thing Jesus wants his disciples to know is that when I show up and you obey me, everything, your circumstance, somehow, some way is changed. Because again, apart from him, nothing is sustainable. Empty, stagnant. But the nets are full. When we simply say, I'm letting go of my net and trusting that you can do a better job than I can. In other words, we are abiding in Jesus. That's trait number one. Trait number two of being a drop net disciple of Jesus is to love like Jesus loved. John 13, Jesus says to his followers, I give you a new commandment. He did not say, here's a suggestion in case, you know, you feel like it or when you get around to it. He's making a commandment because this is what brings life, abiding in life. That you love one another. And right away we say, nope, nope, the world says that's impossible. I mean, really? Love him? Love her? Not a chance. But then he adds this part where he says, just as I have loved you sacrificially, I'm calling you now to love one another sacrificially. That's the key. Because Jesus makes a remarkable claim in that passage. The way our friends and our family and our community and everybody else in this world will know that we are his disciples is because of our love. And I'm not talking about the mamby-pamby kind of love that's running rampant in our culture today. I'm talking about the love of God that stands out above everything else. Where people see you and they go, man, I want what she has. There's something about him that's just so attractive. What is it? What is it? And it's probably not going to come by your theological knowledge or your denominational membership or even your moral purity or even religious observations but simply by letting the love of God come through you because you understand that it's a sacrifice. It's not about me. Again, how did Jesus love us? Sacrificially. Romans 5 and 10 says this, while we were enemies of God. In other words, don't tell me what to do, God, since you said so. It doesn't matter. You're just, you're just a good preacher. Uh, no, I'm in control of my ship. And I, I don't think you can quite do it as well as I can or in the time that I want it done. And so when we do that, we're not abiding in him, are we? We're separating ourselves from him. We're not connected to him anymore. And the Bible says the separation from God is hell itself. And God says, I desire you and I created you not to be in hell, but to be in heaven. And I'm part of the kingdom of God right here on this earth. And so that's why I'm sending my son Jesus to reconcile you back to me. I want you to be a part of something greater than what you think life is supposed to be about. Man, that's a mind blower. Can you guys do that? Love like that, sacrificially like that, can you? <laughs> I can't. And that's the point. You and I cannot love like God loves when we are trying to do it our way. Valentine's Day, limited in our own power and efforts. But simply when we say, because you said so, Lord, and we let go of the nets, it strips us down bare naked to what we really are. Children of God, created by and in the image of a father that just loves. So let's review. We are created and we are called to, one, 
abide in Jesus, to love like Jesus. And then trait number three is to be in a drop net to disciple follower of Jesus, to die to self like Jesus died. The Bible says in Luke chapter 9, he's gathering his disciples and he says to them, if you want to be my followers, if you want to tap into the same kind of relationship I have with the Father, a supernatural relationship, if you want to be a part of miracles and casting out and bringing life and speaking hope, if you want to be a part of that, something that goes way above what the earth offers, I'm offering you kingdom membership, then this is what I want you to do. Don't make it about yourself. Deny yourselves. Take up my cross daily, sacrificially, and follow my ways. I will show you. What an offer. You know, about a month ago, I spoke to the power of humility. If you missed it or you can't remember, you can simply go back online and look up January 15th. In a nutshell, humility is simply this. The emptying of yourself, of you, the denying of yourself, of you, and then filling you back up with Jesus. Now, we hear this. You're still important. It's, you're not a nothing and a nobody. God created you to be you. He loves you. He's given you spiritual gifts. He's given you provisions. He's given you a calling. But he doesn't want you to waste your time doing it in your own efforts. He wants you to die to yourself, walk as you are and created as you are, but filled up with him this time. That's why Paul writes in Galatians chapter 2, I have been crucified with Christ. There's the essence of Christianity. And it is no longer I who live, but it is Christ who lives in me. A new creation with a new purpose. Now, if you're sitting there today thinking, well, Pastor Dan seems to be going a little bit overboard on emphasizing Jesus' definition of what it means to be his drop net disciples, I want you to check out what the Apostle Paul says to Pastor Timothy, a young man that Paul is discipling. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. It says, I, Paul, urge you, Timothy, as I did when I was on my way to Macedonia to remain in Ephesus, that's a tough place to be, so that you may instruct a certain people not to teach any different doctrine other than the true gospel of who Jesus is. We got a little bit of a problem of that in our own culture today. Verse 4, and not to occupy themselves with myths and endless genealogies that promote speculations about who God is, rather than the divine training that is known by faith. I want you to tattoo this next line into your hearts. But the aim, he says, of such instruction is love that comes from a pure heart, a good conscience, and a sincere faith. In that short little passage, we have the same obedience to provision theme that we have in Luke 5. Let's go to verse 5. Love from a pure heart. This fits in with love one another as... He's loved us. So stop trying to love from your own heart. <laughs> it can only go so far before you hit the wall and you kind of go, that makes me mad. That's part of my problem. But instead, love from the pure heart of God. Hmm. Verse 5. Love then followed by a good conscience. Fitting in with, abide in his word. Do not be disconnected. A good conscience is that inner voice that guides to right behavior. Right behavior is righteous behavior. Righteous behavior is when you say to God, I do trust that you can do it better than I. And since you said so, Lord, I'm going to do it. All that leading to a sincere faith. Fitting in with deny yourself now and pick up your cross with Jesus as the ultimate demonstration of a sincere faith. That, here it is, friends, I believe that God can do it better than I can do it. And when that happens, we drop the nets, and here comes the provisions. Last thought. In Luke chapter 5, it was Jesus who created the harvest of the fish. And yet, he still includes his disciples in his miracle. He didn't say, hey, stand off to the side. Let the man come in here. Get away, get away, get away. You can watch, but you can't participate. He doesn't want them to be consumers of ministry. 
He wants them to be co-producers with him in the kingdom of God. We get to be in this together. It's called the body of Christ. We get to celebrate what it looks like to have the harvest field growing around us. Because those guys were still needed, says Jesus. And we are still needed. We are. To labor by using our, our boats, our nets, our skills, our muscles to haul in and to net the people of God. Did I say people? Should I have said fish? The world says fish is a good idea. God says, I'm looking for people. Today, Jesus says, from now on, king of kings, stop being afraid. When you're afraid, it's because you're operating in your own power. When you're afraid, you're operating in the ways of the world. I know it because I've done that a lot, and I'm sick and tired of it. I want you to be sick and tired of it, too, because God has more for us than just being sick. He says, I want you to be a part of what I'm calling you to be. So with that in mind, here's your homework for this week. I'm inviting you to write down the names of three people, three people you would like to practice getting caught for Christ. Three people. We all know at least three. Pray for them. Now, before you start wildly throwing your nets out there, I got I to gotta do what Pastor Dan says. I got to catch people. Stop that. And instead, let's get yourself first right with God. Ask, am I? Am I abiding in Jesus? And if so, he'll tell you where to throw the nets. And then, because you said so, Lord, even though it may not look like it makes sense to you, do it and then find out, wow, what a faith growth that'll be. Are you loving like God loves? Well, again, you can't love on your own the way God loves. So what you're going to have to do is, number three, you're going to have to die to yourself. It's no longer Christ separate from me, but Christ in me. Practice those three traits. There you go, friends. Practice those three traits. And people will be drawn to you like a big old bass is drawn to an ugly old worm. Why? Because you're not a worm anymore. You look like Jesus. People are longing for that kind of hope. They just don't know it. You'll look like Jesus. You'll smell like Jesus. You'll talk like Jesus. You'll be taking on the shape of Jesus. And so that's why next Sunday I'm going to speak to part two of this message of drop dead discipleship by looking at what does it look like what do we participate in to begin, to begin looking more like Jesus, taking on his shape? So that's our practice. That's what we're going to go fishing for this next week. And then I'll see you next Sunday to begin more. In the meantime, have a super Sunday, everybody.